Wow. Thank you. Thank you. You know, go ahead, grab a seat. Go ahead, grab a seat. Thank you, thank you, go ahead. <clears throat> you know, you're probably, you're, thank you. <laughs> All right, I can tell some people are excited. That's great. And that's, that's exactly what I love about this country is we are free to be able to dream. We're free to be able to achieve our dreams if we're willing to do some work. And a lot of people have asked me, so now, now why, Oren, you, you love leadership, you've written a lot of leadership books, why would you go into the political leadership field? And I think that's a valid question. But when I hear, here's kind of how it all started. I looked at America, and I looked at if leadership <clears throat> is so important, it requires freedom. And just as a fish is the last one to discover water because he's just kind of lived in it, America, we've been so used to freedom for so long, we're like fish just kind of swimming along in this water. But if the water is poisoned and all the fish die, then leadership dies with it. And I'm not willing to sit back and let that happen. And so you say, well, why are you getting involved in the political field? Not, I'm not running for government, I'm not interested in that. What I'm interested in is ensuring that our government provides the freedom so that you can achieve your dream. That's important. That is worth fighting for. Now let me explain, this is so important to understand the power pendulum, and you're gonna hear this. It's not specifically mentioned in leadership, but everything I'm gonna to cover today is the background information. Where did leadership come from? What's this proposal that you're talking about of how we can restore American freedoms and allow so many people? I believe that we are on the cusp of a leadership. And Oliver and I, when we got together, we said, you know, if we put these things in place, if we can influence, not force, influence. That's what freedom's about. It's about creating discussions. We're not gonna uh, create some party and demand things. We're going to create a movement of ideas. Because at the end of the day, uh, uh, the day, ideas have consequences. If you create the right ideas and get the right discussions, we're just not having the right discussions right now. We're talking about things that everybody keeps talking about. We got to get the state to do this, and we need to get the state to do this. You know what? We got to get the state to do less and people, leaders, to do more. That's what we need. Now let me show. Here's the power pendulum. <clears throat> Here's the power pendulum. This is so essential. If you get this, then you can really follow the rest of the talk is basically all playing out of this power pendulum. On one side, you have no force in society. See, societies are created without the help of government. People get together and they can trade. You can, if you had an extra snowmobile and you decided that you didn't need this extra one, you can go to your neighbor and talk with them and come up with a price and sell that snowmobile. And you don't need to call the government to see if that's okay right now. <laughs> they might want you to pay a certain amount of tax on that, of course. You know, all, all the other things. We'll get into that later. But, uh, <clears throat> So societies are created with no force. They're just human communities getting together and working and interacting and figuring out, oh, I'm pretty good over here. It all stems from the division of labor. I'm better at this area. You're better at this area. Why don't I take my extra corn that I produced and you've got some extra wheat and why don't we do a trade? And we started with barter and eventually came to money and society exploded. Uh, the Western societies exploded in wealth, all this production going on. Things were going fantastic. But then they realized, wait a minute. Now all of a sudden we've got property, we've got incomes going up, and we get wealth. Well, if everybody was an angel, it wouldn't be a problem. We wouldn't need police. No one will come into your house and take your stuff. But we said, man, you know, as this society gets bigger and there's more wealth, there's more of a risk of the five laws of decline because the, one of the standard rules of life is if you have a choice, if most people are given a choice between working for a living or giving a handout for a living, or some other means of being able to take from somebody else without having to produce themselves, they'll, they will choose plunder over production. Because production's harder. It's harder to go to work and make it. It's easier to be able to sit at home. If someone said, we'll send you the same amount of money and you don't have to show up to work, that's a pretty hard temptation not to want to take. You'd be like, yeah, I'll go ahead and stay home. Just send the checks. That's great. <clears throat> so what happened is they realized society couldn't live with no force. There had to be things like a police officers. 
There had to be things like a, a military in order that another country wouldn't see the wealth being created in this society. And another country say, well, let's just march over. Since we haven't figured out how to create a free society, let's just march over and steal our neighbors. Kind of like anybody heard of North and South Korea. I mean, here's the same people. I mean, they're the same people, same background, same history. And one of them is one of the most productive societies around, the free South Korea. And one of them is broke. They can't even afford to feed their own people. North Korea, and yet they're the same people. But it's a different structure. You see, one of them is founded upon less force, and one of them is founded upon absolute force. So what this is, is it's a power pendulum. The question is, every society has a certain amount of force in it. You, we all agree that you can't have a no-force society because we know that some people will choose to plunder other people's goods. So we're going to have to have enough force to protect society without getting too much force to kill society. You see, the, the, it's called, the state and society work together in a proper understanding. The state defends the society. It doesn't destroy the society. But if the state is given too much force, it turns into a parasite that actually eats the organism it's living off of. Has anybody here... <clears throat> Does anybody remember the Soviet Union? It fell upon its own weight. Why? Because the state used absolute control, coerced its citizens. It wasn't concord. See, here's the three levels. If you have no force within society, then you're in danger. Every night you go to bed, you wonder if someone's going to come into your house and take from you. I'm thankful when I see a police officer. I'm thankful for what they do. I'm thankful for our military that I know that no one's going to come in and take from our country. That's great. It is absolutely essentially needed. Now here's the question. How much is needed? How much is needed? Do we need everybody to be in the military? Should everybody, because if everybody was in the military, who would produce in order to provide the funds to pay the military? You say, well, not everybody can be a police officer. And that we know we need it, but we also need businessmen. We also need uh, mothers, we also need all the different professions. Society has to be a wide division of labor. The bigger the division of labor, the more production. So we don't want no force because that would go to chaos. There's got to be someone who's sovereign, someone who leads the country. And the, the right amount is you want to have mostly freedom with just enough of a government for two reasons. Internal and external defense. That's it. What is government's true design? If you go back and look at history, why were governments formed? Two reasons, two legitimate reasons. Internal and external defense. If I've got an issue with Larry, instead of Larry and me going and fighting on the street corner, we can go and adjudicate. If we can't work it out as men, we could go and get that adjudicated through a judicial system, which replaces taking guns and going and shooting it out. You see, that's a society. That's a civilized society. We can settle disputes without guns and knives. Does anybody remember Al Capone in Chicago and the gang? See, that got to where the bad guys had more force than the sovereigns of the city. And so then, then you'd see one gang wiping out another gang. It turned into chaos. We certainly don't want that. That's the worst of all solutions. So we're not saying anarchy, we're not saying no government, we're saying limited government. How do we limit government?